Hello and welcome to another episode of the Life After Cardiac Arrest podcast with me, your host, Paul Swindell. Today I'm talking with Jasmine Wiley, who's across the pond in the US. And Jasmine is a cardiac arrest survivor, patient advocate and online community leader. Welcome, Jasmine. Thanks for having me. And how are you today? I'm doing well today. It's very early in the US. And whereabouts are you exactly? I live in San Francisco, California. Uh huh. And how long have you been there? I've lived here since 2015. I'm originally from the Midwest and uh, in the state of Indiana. And is that where you had your cardiac arrest? My cardiac arrest, yes, was in Indiana. Um, I lived in Bloomington, Indiana, which is a, a university town where Indiana University is located. And I was still living there after college um, when I had my cardiac arrest. So, so when was that and how old were you? So I was 24 years old, um, previously healthy, you know, nor- broken bones and, and the normal <laughs> bits of health things, but nothing abnormal. Um, and everything had been a, a normal day, a normal evening, and I went to bed. And um, early in the next morning, I believe shortly before I would have normally woken up uh, around 8 a.m., my husband woke to the sound of me gasping in bed beside him. And now we know that was agonal breathing. <laughs> so that woke him up, and he called 911 and did CPR. And that's why I'm here. Uh-huh. And so do you know how long he did that for? So my estimated downtime, um, I guess from the time of the call until EMS arrived and was able to to revive me, was estimated at 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes. So I was a comatose survivor. It only took one one shock to, to revive me. Um, but I was a comatose survivor. I didn't wake up. And so I was taken to the hospital, and I was taken to a hospital that had just recently started doing the therapeutic hypothermia treatment um, to cool you after a cardiac arrest to preserve neurological function. So I was the, the 10th patient at my my hospital that had that done. Uh-huh. What hospital was that? Because that, that was uh, 2009, wasn't it? Was, it was, yeah, 2009. So there weren't a lot, not as many hospitals that were doing that at the time. It sort of was just taking off. Um, so I was at a, a fairly small hospital um, in a city of about 100,000 um, in Bloomington, Indiana. And they had just recently started doing it as a, a you know, a trial or, or something of that nature. And I was the, the 10th patient they had cooled at that hospital. And it happened to be the hospital that was, you know, four blocks from my where I lived um, at the time, which was perhaps very fortunate for me because there were only two hospitals in that state. So, and then that's, you know, a small area of the country that, that offered that treatment. So there's of course no way to know if, if that's why you had a good outcome long-term, but based on the neuro exam I had when I was admitted to the hospital, you know, it must've helped because I, I was, you know, not not conscious, not, you know, responding to stimuli, things like that, that, that have all the indicators of having poor neurological function. And after a few days of a cold coma, I woke up, I could recognize my family, I could talk. Um, I wasn't fine. (laughs) I had a lot of um, confusion and, and memory issues and, you know, things like that. But, but I, I was, they were optimistic that I would have a really good outcome. And I did. It just took a while. Um, I forget roughly two to three years after my cardiac arrest. Um, it's hard to quantify because things started coming back, you know, in bits and pieces. And so it's spotty memories for a period. And then after about three years, everything's pretty solid. Um, so 10 years is how long it was in August. It was when I celebrated 10 years since my cardiac arrest. Uh, I may not remember the first uh-huh. two or three, but I, I did have a good outcome was- long-term. Uh, I don't have any anything 
that I would consider, you know, a deficiency, a disabling condition or anything like that. I have some quirks. Uh, I have some. We we all have our quirks. Don't yes, we? <laughs> we all have quirks. And I have very different quirks than I did have, you know, before my cardiac arrest. You know, that was a. I was just going to say, just before your card, you, you said you were, you were healthy and you were t- uh, yes. 24, I think. Did, did you have any other sort of uh, symptoms prior to your event or was there anything in your family or anything that was? Uh... So I, I have a family history uh, of unexpected sudden death in young people um, in my extended family um, and aunts and some cousins that 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 died in sort of you know ways that were not explained that were sort of out of nowhere but i have a very large family and this was spanning over two generations and so no one thought it was a familial thing um it was just you know unfortunate things happen sometimes you know there was a crib death things like that so you don't you don't make those connections until someone is diagnosed with with a genetic condition, which I was. Mm-hmm. Um, so can you tell me what you were diagnosed with? So I was diagnosed with congenital long QT syndrome. Long QT syndrome is is a um, an electrical condition of the heart. It's it's a heart rhythm condition that predisposes you to have potentially fatal arrhythmias sometimes. And the typical symptoms of long QT are are fainting, or you can present a seizure, or you can have a cardiac arrest, as I did. I didn't have a a strong history of of seizure or fainting. I had one unexplained faint when I was in high school, but I never, I don't even know if I sought, I don't believe I sought care for that. Um, It was just one of those things, you know, I was probably doing something I shouldn't have been doing. I was a high school student partying with my friends. You know, I just, just, it's a blackout situation. You don't run to the doctor necessarily because you've lost consciousness. So I didn't have a lot of warning signs. It came pretty out of nowhere. I was healthy. You know, some people with long QT have a a history of seizure or fainting that's unexplained. And that's how they get diagnosed, which is which is better than being diagnosed after a cardiac arrest. Um, it, it's it's not the worst way to be diagnosed, though. You know, a, a post mortem diagnosis is the worst way to find out that you have a condition. So, of course, yeah. But uh, on that night or that morning when it happened, was there anything unusual? Had you done anything different? What? Why, I'm always interested if if you got this uh, sort of hereditary thing, why it should be triggered that morning. Have you, right. have you well, got any inklings or to why that? No, would have been? no. It's a lot of a lot of people do have, uh, you know, a, a precipitating factor that that could be explained as, you know, this might have been why it happened at this time. Why this condition I've always had sort of surfaced. Maybe they were taking a medication or had been ill, you know, with with vomiting or whatever that had disrupted electrolyte imbalance. But I I didn't have anything unusual. I was, it was a totally normal week day. I was feeling fine. Nothing occurred. I don't even have a known trigger as to what triggered the cardiac arrest. I have type two long QT syndrome. There are different types depending on what gene is affected, um, which affects the potassium, the, the, the ion channel function. It's a potassium channel in my case. I have long QT type 2, and common triggers for long QT type 2 are uh, startles or emotions. So like a startling noise is a common, uh, is sort of the stereotype trigger, an alarm clock, a phone ringing, you know, something of that nature. I imagine they're pretty hard to avoid. Them. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but also in the same, the same time, you can also have events that occur at rest with no precipitating factor just in your sleep. Uh, so I, I don't know if, if there was something that, you know, caused an adrenaline response that, that led to my cardiac arrest. I don't know, maybe a truck backfired outside my window, uh, you know, some noise outside, but, but I don't know of any, and my alarm wasn't going off. So as far as I know, it was, either in my sleep or perhaps because I had woken up just naturally and that triggered it. 
And the reason I think that is because uh, a year later, almost a year later, I had my first ICD shock. So I got an ICD um, after my cardiac arrest as, as treatment, an implanted defibrillator. And before a year had passed, it was like 11 and a half months, I had sort of a repeat of the same scenario. I was at home in bed with my husband. It was early morning and I woke up and then with before I'd even had time to sit up or, you know, move to get off the bed, I got shocked. So, and that was appropriate shock for the arrhythmia long QT predisposes you to torsades de Ponce. And so, so just based on the circumstances of that repeat occurrence, um, Almost a year later, when I was shocked, appropriately shocked by my ICD, I, I speculate that I had just woken up the morning of my cardiac arrest. And then shortly after waking up, <laughs> had, had an arrhythmia triggered, um, that the very act of waking up is what was the, the trigger for, for my cardiac arrest, which is, you know, it, it's funny in some ways <laughs> that waking up can can cause you to to have a potentially fatal arrhythmia. But but that's that's the the nature of the condition I have. There's some interesting triggers. You can read case reports on on different triggers that have occurred to people. Uh, laughter, you know, some people emotion triggered events are really common. Some of the most interesting ones are there was one about how an earthquake triggered <laughs> an event, meaning the emotional response uh, to an earthquake. And, and and there's there's often recommendations that, you know, you reduce your exposure to triggers in long QT syndrome. That doesn't always make a lot of sense for, for people with, with my type, long QT2, um, because you can't avoid startles by very definition, you know, an unexpected noise. <laughs> It's something you're not expecting, and so it's. I encounter startling things and and unexpected noises every day. I live in San Francisco, and I walk through the city, and there's noise, and there's you know all kinds of things that come up in life, and so I can't avoid what could trigger me to have an an arrhythmia. So I'm just thankful that I have treatment. Mm -hmm. So so what is that treatment? So the typical uh, treatment for long QT syndrome, the mainstay of treatment, is a beta blocker, a medication that sort of blunts the the effects of adrenaline on your body. Uh, I I actually uh, don't take betas; they're not part of my treatment plan, as I'm not tolerant. I'm not able to tolerate them um, without extreme side effects that really reduce my quality of life. And so my current treatment is I have a dual chamber ICD. I'm an implanted pacemaker defibrillator, and I am paced for bradycardia. My heart drops very low in my sleep, and so I'm paced to keep my heart rate above a certain rate, and that's that's sort of a preventative measure because um, that sets up the conditions for which it's a it's a kind of a perfect storm situation a, an ideal situation for me to have an event would be when my heart rate is very low and then something triggers an arrhythmia so i'm paced to keep my my heart rate above 60 60 beats per minute so i don't have bradycardia anymore <laughs> that's the cutoff for bradycardia so i haven't had bradycardia in many years um so how does that affect you having uh, a heart rate that's always above 60? Uh, you know, it doesn't, it, it doesn't, I don't notice it. It's atrial pacing um, from the lead in the top of my heart, which is more, more closely mimics a, a, a physiological norm, a, a normal heart rate because the stimulus comes from the same area of the heart. And so I don't feel it. I am not aware that I'm being paced. The quality of my sleep has changed a lot. Um, my heart rate, which I didn't know prior to my cardiac arrest, I'd never, you know, had lots of cardiac workup. My heart rate drops really low in my sleep, and so it doesn't anymore. And I used to wake up frequently throughout the night and be very. I, I had a lot of, of sleep issues. A, you know. Of waking up and having trouble staying asleep and just waking up in the night, I would wake up gasping sometimes. 
and I don't do that anymore. And so I don't know if it's because my heart rate was, was so low in my sleep, but that's sort of what I, I speculate because my quality of sleep that I get now is so much better than it was prior to being paced. Is that was that before your cardiac arrest? You used to wake up gasping. Yeah, for... I had, and it was funny because my my husband, who was beside me when I had my cardiac arrest, was sort of used to me doing strange things in the night. <laughs> and so, you know, when he woke to the sound of me making these funny gasps, he didn't immediately think something is wrong. He thought, you know, oh, she's doing one of those weird things. Maybe she's dreaming, you know, and it took him, you know, just coming out of sleep to a little bit to realize that this was this was different, that there was something really, really wrong. And I stopped moving and he turned on the light and I was blue. <laughs> so that's when he 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 jumped into action to to call 911 and to give chest compressions. Uh-huh top guy yeah he is he is he is a tough guy um it's it's interesting because you know we were so young when this occurred i was 24 and he was 26 we'd known each other since since our school days you know since high school uh but we were we were fairly young to suddenly be dealing with you know he he was my my caregiver for a while. <laughs> and that's a that's a hard thing to put on any relationship, but it's certainly not something that you expect when you're in your 20s um uh, for for someone to have a serious health issue, you know, you may in sickness and in health, but you're you're planning on that being when you're older. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not yeah. not when so you're it's... not when you've just graduated from college. And so, you know, I'm I'm really blessed that I had the support system that I had, that I have a spouse who, who was very supportive and, and, you know, held space for me when I was recovering. And not everyone has, has that, you know, I had my spouse, I had a family and all of my friends, and I had as good a medical care as one can hope for. I had a a great cardiac electrophysiologist and an endocrinologist and a um, primary care physician. And they were all sort of, you know, monitoring my recovery. And I didn't have any care specific to my neurological function. But if I had not been showing signs that I was recovering just with normal, you know, back to life care of family, I would have been referred, I believe, by by the physicians I did have, you know, there's a lot of gaps in care, um, among cardiac arrest survivors. We don't get Mm -hmm. all of our, our needs met for families as well. You know, there's, there's such a, a variety of experiences, not just in how people are affected, you know, in, in a physiological sense, you know, if they have some degree of brain injury, how they're, overall health is, their cardiac function, that sort of thing, but also in how people react emotionally. But there's also big differences in the the, the kind of support system we have in regards to, you know, our family, our friends, our close network. And I was really lucky that I had all of that support from my family. If I had not, it would have been much harder on me to navigate life after a cardiac arrest, to navigate the U.S. healthcare system, to Uh all of that. Uh, Hopefully we can cover that a little bit as well, some of those subjects that you've just touched on. Um, But what were you exactly like, say, the first three, six months after you came out of hospital? So I had had short-term memory loss. at first it was severe. I was like a goldfish. <laughs> you know, I couldn't remember the plastic castle. I I couldn't carry on a long conversation because I would forget what we had discussed, you know, several minutes before. <laughs> I couldn't retain information for very long. And and that persisted for a while and then it, it got better dramatically, like a big progress, you know, within the, the first several weeks, couple months I was home. And then and I was able to function okay on a, a day-to-day basis. I wasn't able to work. I I played housewife <laughs> for a while and you know, I could I could cook a simple meal, I could, you know, care for my dog, I could 
water the plants in the garden. I could, I could do, you know, normal sort of daily tasks like that. But I was, you know, not, not who I was before, who was very on top of things and, and had a lot of projects in motion and was able to work. Um, and so it took me a while to, to recover to the point of, being able to be in the workforce to, you know, do complex math or, <laughs> or, or anything of, of that sort. And I did, I got back to it eventually. Um, what were you working as? Um, at the time of my cardiac arrest, I had just graduated from, from art school. And so I was, I had an internship in a museum and was waiting tables in a pub. Um, in the evenings, because you don't get paid for for internships, and so I, I was I was a waitress in a pub, which is a is a job that is fairly mentally taxing. It requires that you have you know good multitasking skills and memory skills and all of those things, which I definitely did not have after my cardiac arrest. So I wasn't able to return to that job. I did return to the workforce a little under two years later in a much simpler job that was more, you know, learn this task and do it in a repetitive sort of way that was less challenging for me with my memory issues. So I did eventually go back to the the job in the pub, sort of just to prove to myself that I could. Um, you never would think that you know being a, a waitress in a in a pub is going to be your achievement in life, but after the the issues that I had experienced and recovered from, it was a really proud moment for me to go back temporarily and work <laughs> in that position and be able to do it. And it was different from before. I have my brain works differently now, but I'm. I'm a capable person. I'm just a different version. Uh-huh. So, uh, no, you've done a ma- marvelous since uh, since your cardiac arrest. But and you're right to to go back into a position like that. You you need to be thinking on your feet yes, as well, yes. don't you? <laughs> the, the fact is, you're going to be on your feet as a waitress as well. How, how did the physical aspect of that um, role? How did you cater with that? So, I I don't have any. Um... I didn't have any physical challenges. Uh, Immediately after my my cardiac arrest, I, in the hospital and and the first, you know, few weeks at home, I I was not real steady on my feet. I had some reconditioning in the hospital to to help me learn to walk straight so I didn't weave around like a drunk. (laughs) But, But I was fairly okay physically as far as what I was capable of. Um, By the time I returned home and and I, I didn't, I don't have physical limitations because of my, my condition. Um, you know, by most standards, I'm a, a healthy young person. And so I, I was able to exercise and, you know, do physical tasks probably much sooner than I was able to do complicated mental tasks. <laughs> So did you go through any rehab? I mean, is, is that something that they, so, no, they do? So, no, I I, um, I had in the hospital before I, before I got my ICD and was discharged, I had two days of reconditioning, which I believe was done through the physical therapy department. And it was just, um, you know, helping me walk and so my gait would be normal and, and things like that. Uh, so I'd be more balanced. And but I, I I did really well with it, you know, and I was able to walk unassisted and but the end of that couple of days and so I got an I C D and they put me in the car with my family <laughs> and said I would probably be okay in a year. And so, you know, we we didn't have a, um, a lot. We were given, my family was given some advice on, on sort of things they could do to facilitate my, my neuro recovery, you know, encourage me to read, to do puzzles, to, you know, do things that challenge my brain. And they were given the advice to treat me as normally as possible, which for a while, um, I did. I didn't understand that. You know, I didn't understand why I was so broken and everyone was acting like I was fine. 
Mm-hmm. And I, I, I don't think that anyone's uh, aftercare is handled perfectly. But I think for my situation, because of the support system that I had, that was really good advice because I was 24 years old. I had just been diagnosed with a genetic heart condition, got an ICD, and was recovering from a cardiac arrest. I think it was really important that I not view myself as disabled by my health circumstances, that I not view myself as broken, as, you know, that I couldn't be repaired. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point for you, for your self esteem. Yeah. And-, and, and so I never, I never let it become part of my identity. I, I, I never used the term brain injury until years later. Once it was something that was just something that had happened to me during the time I was, oh, I'm okay, you know, and just doing the best I could. And it was, in a way, my my driving force was. You know, no one, I don't think I was fully aware of the extent that I was affected. And so I thought, you know, I just need to try harder. (laughs) You know, I'm not remembering this stuff. I'm not organized in this way. I just need to find a different way to do it. And, and I learned a lot of, of new ways of, of, of coping with these, these, these issues that I had because I was trying so hard to seem like I was fine. Mm-hmm. That sounds very familiar to me, <laughs> uh, similar to me, actually. And I think a lot of people go through that working out their own coping strategies, perhaps because we're let down by yeah. our uh, respective health systems right. in that we're, we're not diagnosed as having a particular um, neurological uh, impact yes. and uh, we can't think as clearly as we used to. And uh but do you think that's changing? I think I think it is. It is absolutely changing in the U.S. and um, a lot of places. Um, there's there's several uh, centers. Uh, there's a, at least several that I know of that are that are centers within hospital systems that are set up for survivors of cardiac arrest that are more comprehensive clinics that include, you know, psychological care that include, you know, different therapies, that kind of things, um, maybe even resources for their families. And I, and I think it is changing. It's disheartening in a way (laughs) how I'm 10 years into this and there's still such gaps in care and such a need for support for those who, who survive and for their family members that many, many people don't get and that's that was my my motivation for for seeking out and then eventually you know helping build and grow um, online patient support communities. Um, I so that's a great point. Could you could you sort of a, a great point for you to sort of um, let's talk about that really because you, you you're a well I'll introduce you and said you're an online community leader and a patient advocate, and that's. Um, I've seen you on the Facebook um, in particular, and you you do a huge amount on that. So if you could tell us a little bit what you do. Yeah. Um, so so I, I am one of the administrators of a, a Facebook group uh, for cardiac arrest survivors. And I believe it is, I believe the group is currently the biggest online community of, of cardiac arrest survivors on any platform that I'm aware of, at least was at one time, that it includes, you know, cardiac arrest survivors from all over the world, um, English speaking, so heavily, you know, U.S., Canada, U.K., Australia, the, the English speaking countries, which is, you know, how you and I got to meet. <laughs> um, but it started very small, and I, I can't really speak to the formation of that because that was when I was still in the thick of recovery. Um, so I don't actually remember sort of how it got going, but I know that it started uh, some of us that had met on a different um, online platform for for chatting that that have then formed this group on on Facebook to be a place for survivors to discuss the experience of surviving and all of the challenges afterwards and on celebrations too. One of my favorite things that, that we do in that group is we celebrate, you know, anniversaries of our, of our cardiac arrests. People will use the term rebirth day. Um, so someone will post, you know, it's been 
three years since my cardiac arrest. And then you get hundreds of replies, you know, saying happy rebirthday. And, and it's, so it's, it's not all a uh, grim talking about <laughs> the problems we have. It's also expressing gratitude and, and this all aspects of this shared experience of, of having a cardiac arrest, even though our circumstances might be different, our recoveries may have been different, you know, where we, where we live in the world might be different. (laughs) It's, it's Mm -hmm. really, it's really been really cool to see this. Um, It's taught me a lot about community and human connection to see that this group of people that is diverse in age and country, um, in, in their health circumstances and their life circumstances to have this one common thread that, that brings them together and to be able to not be alone on this journey of trying to navigate the world after they've been through something like a cardiac arrest. And so mm-hmm. I benefited a lot from, from the, the connections that I made online. It was my, my space to discuss all of those things that I, I didn't discuss other other where, you know, any, in any other place. Um, you know, I, I tried very hard. My family was also recovering from their trauma of the experience. And so, you know, I tried very hard to be okay as to seem okay, uh, to seem like I was happy and like I was grateful and I was excited about life. And, and there were a lot of parts of it that were really, really, really difficult. Um, one thing I say a lot to survivors is that, you know, gratitude and grief can coexist. And the, the expectation of gratitude put on someone who've sur- who has survived something that is uncommon to survive. Uh, there can be this expectation of gratitude. When I tell people I had a cardiac arrest, I, I often get the reaction is, wow, you're so lucky to have survived <laughs> or something of that effect. And so you know, you, you are very aware of this, that you're supposed to be grateful, even if you're dealing with some challenging things, if your whole life has been disrupted, if, you know, you're, you're still recovering from a physical standpoint or from a neurological standpoint, or you have, you know, the emotional aftermath, all of that stuff, there, there's still this often this knee jerk reaction from people of, you know, you should be grateful, <laughs> And so yeah, I, I know it's I've, I've come across that as well many times yeah. as well. But, and, and, and people think you're perhaps like a computer. You can be turned off and turned right. back on again and you're OK. Right. Right. And so, you know, it's and I think because I was so, I guess, concerned about easing the burden on my family who had been through, you know, in some ways I feel lucky. I don't remember. (laughs) I don't remember my cardiac arrest. I don't remember when I was in a coma and when I was, you know, my heart was unstable and I was coding. I don't remember that. My family does though, you know, so it's, I, I was cognizant even early in recovery. I think I was, I was aware that, that this was a traumatic thing for my family. And so it wasn't something that a lot of them wanted to discuss. And so I needed a place to be able to discuss it. And at the time, you know, I, I was a 24 year old. My, my friends were, you know, just graduating from college. Recovery from a cardiac arrest was not something that any of my peers (laughs) had been through. Um, Having a, a serious heart condition was not something that any of my peers had been through. Having an ICD was not something any of my peers had been through. And so my way to find peers, not only people in general who had been through these things, but also young people who were dealing with the the unique experience of being a young person who is suddenly, you know, sitting in the waiting room of a cardiology office waiting to get your defibrillator checked. (laughs) You know, having having an online, a global online peer support community was so instrumental in my recovery and my not feeling alone as I went through this. That, you know, even after I stopped needing 
that place as a place for support for me. I was very motivated to help ensure that it existed for those new people who found us. And so I've been an admin of that community for, I don't know how many years, a lot of years now, like seven <laughs> years, maybe. I was, going to say, and, I was going to say, at what point did you feel that it was a, the, the, the point flipped where you became um, a giver rather than a taker? Well, you know, and it's funny because I, I don't know that that ever, it ever was a, a clear flip of that nature. I have actually some things that was sent to me by a cardiac arrest survivor that I spoke with years ago had, had sent me, wanted to send me a, a small gift, a thank you card or something. And so she, she mailed me a thank you card and inside of it was a, a magnet, you know, like with an inspirational quote to put on your fridge. And it said, sometimes we give and receive comfort sometimes at the same time. And I still have that hanging on my fridge. And that mm -hmm. is exactly what it is for me. You know, when people thank me, <laughs> when I get praise or, you know, thanked for, for running a community for, you know, or helping with other communities, I moderate and a group for people with, with an ICD as well. When I get, when I get thanked for, for helping run these communities, it's always such a weird feeling that causes in me. It's I'm surprised by it. It's like, why would anyone thank me for doing something that has been such an amazing force for good in my own life that has helped me immensely? It's like, you know, I, it's hard to quantify, you know, how, how it has affected my life to, to be involved in, in making sure that, that people have these communities and have these spaces to use each other as a resource because they're lacking, you know, the, the gaps in their care. They're not getting all of their needs met. And as we search for information, we find each other. And that can become a really amazing resource for people who are you know, in need of a lot of things or not sure where to go. <laughs> and so it's... Exactly. I mean, uh, the social media gets a bad rap a lot of the time, but I think it's incredibly powerful, as you were saying, yes. in, in this sort of space. Yeah, I, I think it's funny. Yeah, it, I was really... It's funny with social media. So I'm actually... I'm I'm of the, the generation that, you know, Facebook was, was founded. When I was in college was when it first started, and it was only for college students. And I was opposed to it. You know, I, I was never going to participate in social media. I was really like, oh, no, that's not for me. You know, I'd rather be in a f sitting in a field reading a book of poetry <laughs> or, you know, whatever. I didn't I didn't want to be a part of social media. And I didn't join Facebook until after my cardiac arrest. Um, I think my motivating factor was to read the things that friends had shared about me when I was in the hospital and when I was, when, when I had an uncertain outcome. I don't remember that, of course, but that I never would have thought that, you know, starting a, a Facebook account would have eventually led to me, you know, being someone that is, is thought of as, as a, as a leader in this, you know, patient community space. <laughs> And involved mm -hmm. with advocacy things. And, and I have other social media accounts now too. You know, I, I have a, a presence on Twitter and Instagram and, and it's, it's not the me that I, I never imagined this was the life that I would have. I, before my cardiac arrest, I, as I said, I was in a, doing an internship in a museum. I wanted to work in conservation. I wanted to spend my life <laughs> in the basement of a museum, never speaking to anyone. <laughs> And instead, I became someone who has, you know, helped form communities and, and, and been highly social, especially on social media. So that's, that's not something that I have, I ever thought my life would be like, but it's, it's, it sounds like it's for the better. Yeah. I mean, I, and I, you know, it's like, it's funny. I, I, I always use the term silver lining. Like I'm relentless in, in trying to find the silver lining and experiences that I go through and 
you know, I, I searched for, for years. I thought, you know, that there would be some, some moment, some, something that culminated <laughs> and some amazing thing that occurred in this. I'd be like, this is why I lived. But, you know, I, I don't think that that was, that there's ever going to be one, one moment. I think that it's the silver lining is the people that I've met. You know, there are some of the wonders of my world, and I never would have met any of these people that I, I helped support and helped create a space for them to support each other. I never would have met these people. Some of have become very dear friends of mine if I hadn't have experienced my cardiac arrest. And so it's hard to say I wish that never happened to me, you know, because that's the silver lining is this this tribe of people that that I found absolutely but life is what you make it though and you know it, you have to sometimes it, I don't know maybe we because we stare death in the face maybe we're open to saying yes to a few more yes. things I, I know I certainly am oh for uh-huh. sure for sure I I I think a lot of the opportunities that I've that I've had, especially in the in the, the, the advocacy space, have been these these random things that that didn't necessarily I didn't seek out, I didn't plan for. They were just opportunities, you know, just like you messaged me and are like, Hey, you wanna be on a podcast? <laughs> I, I've had a lot of opportunities like this over the years to to share my story, to do public speaking, to, to be involved in, in different events. And they're always just people that contact me and say, Hey, you want to do this? And I say, sure, why not? And I think that attitude of, of, you know, sure, (laughs) I'll try that because I'm, I'm not as uh, hesitant or maybe fearful of, of the outcome as I was before my, before my cardiac arrest, I think I was a lot more prone to, you know, causing, being stressed out about, you know, how something would go or if it was the right decision or, you know, overthinking things. Whereas now I just, I just sort of go with things. And, and I think part of why I, I have developed this, this mindset is because you know, I made a lot of mistakes and I misspoke. I stuck my foot in the ma- my mouth a lot after my cardiac arrest. I didn't have the best discretion of time and place to say things. You know, I said some inappropriate things at times that, you know, you shouldn't have said that. I, and I had a lot of, of things like that, but I realized that nobody held that against me. You know, people are more forgiving than we think. And so... I I lost all illusions of perfection <laughs> after my, my cardiac arrest, not just, you know, in the most comical way and that I can't be perfect if I can't even keep myself alive all the time, but but also, you know, in my recovery there I had I had a lot of issues. I, I said some things and made some mistakes and you know, I would start projects and not carry them through and things like that. And, and I still, at the end of the day, I still had this group of people who, who loved me, who respected me, who all of that, who didn't write me off as a person because I made mistakes. And I think that has definitely informed the way I live my life now that I'm well, I'm less uh, afraid of, of judgment from others. I'm less afraid of, of taking chances, of taking risks, of doing things that I'm not 100% comfortable with just to see, you know, just to try it, just to see how it goes. And, you know, that's, that's how I have found my way. And it's been, it's been really, it's been really incredible to, to be someone who is open to the opportunities that life has presented to me. Uh-huh. It's, it really sounds like it. It's not the best thing, but as you say, the silver lining. Yes. One of the doctors that I work with, he says that you know, um, most people are different after their cardiac arrest. Some people are, are worse off, but some, uh, bizarrely, are better off. And it sounds like almost that you're one of those that are in the camp of better off now. Yeah, you, you I, I think it sounds like. I think it took me really a, a long time to to. I think it's only been in the last maybe few years that, that I would agree with you (laughs) there. And I'm 10 years out, you know, it took a long time for me to feel like 
you know, you have to, you have to, to learn to integrate these things that you go through into your identity in a way that it's not all of you, but it's part of you and you're at peace with it. And it took me a very long time to, to make my peace with this. And now long term, and I hope for the rest of my life, you know, I, I am at peace with it. And I, and I do feel like in a lot of ways, it, it has brought about a lot of beneficial things in my life that I, that I survived a cardiac arrest and went through that experience. So, you know, in the end, I, I am, I am one of those people who, who is, is in some ways thankful for, for having had to go through that. It's been a journey though. Yes. <laughs> oh, for sure. <laughs> I'm, I'm conscious of the time now. Um, and I just, thought perhaps we could uh, finish up on, um, have you got any tips that you give for for other cardiac arrest survivors going through that journey? So, you know, I, I, I sing the praises of peer support and I, of course, I have to give a shout out to that, you know, find, find people who, who have been through something similar to be a resource for you, whether that is, you know, an in-person support group, whether that is an online community, whatever, that can be really beneficial to, to connect with your peers. They can be a really great resource and part of your, your experience of, of recovering and, and healing, but also, you know, to, to not be afraid to, to say when you need help from medical professionals, you know, if you're struggling with anxiety, depression, PTSD, if you're struggling with any of those things, you don't have to bear that burden alone. Your cardiology providers, your, you know, the regular part of your care team may not be able to meet those needs. And there's nothing wrong with, with reaching out and saying, you know, I could use some help, some support with, with the the mental health side of things that that can be sometimes extremely beneficial to people. So I would encourage people to to not be afraid to ask for help, um, whether that's from peers, whether that's from family, whether that's from from a, a professional, um, a healthcare professional. Other than that, I, I think the biggest, the best bit of advice to to anyone that is, is going that has survived a cardiac arrest is to keep going, (laughs) to know that, you know, life, the way you feel right after, the way you feel a week after, a month after, it's a lot to go through. It's, it's a really, it's, it's, there's a lot involved with, with having that sort of life experience. And so sometimes it's about putting one foot after another and keep trudging forward. And, you know, eventually you get to a spot where you are years out and you're on a podcast <laughs> being asked what your best advice is, you know, and then I, I, I had a lot of really dark times and a lot of times when I was really not confident that my life would ever be good again, but my life is, is great now. You know, I have a really beautiful life and I'm able to see that now. And I'm really glad that I, that I kept trudging on and, and, and I eventually got there. That's some. That's really great to hear, and some incredibly wise words. Um, and I really, it's been a real pleasure talking with you uh, this afternoon or this morning, as yes. you are there. Um, so I really, really, really thank you again, and hopefully we can do it again because there were some other subjects I'd love to talk to you about, but I think we probably run out of time today. But once again, thank you very much for your time and uh, hopefully I'll speak to you soon. Yes, sounds good. I'd love to do it again sometime. So it's good to talk to you, Paul. Okay, bye.